tugging a glider, the way we always practiced it, except that I've never been in the air with a whole army before. Three airborne divisions, the 6th British and 82nd and 101st Americans. Just before the glider pilot cast off over the landing zone, I, I wished a good luck over the radio. It seemed a sort of inadequate thing to say. As Supreme Commander, let me break in at this point to say just a word about the Navy. From the moment of embarkation to that of landing, the full burden fell upon the Navy and our merchant fleets. They had to sweep the mines, bombard the coastal batteries, marshal and protect the transports along the coastline preparatory to landing, and finally, man the small boats that carry the soldiers to the beach. On that day, there were more than 8,000 ships and landing craft on the shores of Normandy. It was a most intricate task and a vital one for the success of our plans. The courage, fidelity, and skill of the Royal and American Navies have no brighter page in their histories than that of June 6, 1944. <laughs> few people knew. It was a well-kept secret. Around daybreak, we correspondents were called and told to be at the Ministry of Information at eight. Then they told us. Beach Omaha. Don't ask me why. I've never been to Omaha, the one in Nebraska, I mean. If it's anything like Omaha, France, you can have it. I understand Omaha was the roughest spot. We lost some good men. We took a few prisoners. It was a lousy trade. We've been told what to expect, so it wasn't like a surprise or anything. It just, well, when it really happens, it's different. For a while there, we were pinned down, but the lucky thing, the other beaches were going better, so we got a little more than our share of the old teamwork. The Navy come in, the air guys, and finally we got moving good. You now you hear a lot about how long it takes to make battle-hardened soldiers out of green troops. Listen, I got to be a veteran in one day, that day. And so they paved the beaches with their blood and lurched across the dunes and reached the road. The German parried fiercely. In the depths of rich green pastured Normandy, the three airborne divisions, first of all to land, fought lion-like against most grievous odds. 
and loud across the cratered face of France came German reinforcements. From Berlin, a voice cried out the Allies must be hurled into the sea before another day had burned its hole in history. Locked in battle, the armies clashed. Our first objective, then, was to merge all the beachheads into one and 50 miles of men drive on together beyond the red sands through the broken wall. Where I was, it wasn't too bad getting ashore. After that, it started. We had to fight for every bloody field. And it was the same each time. You crawl on your belly, keeping your backside down like you'd been told. Chuck in a few hand grenades, then rush them. Sometimes they killed us, but we were killing more of them. The trickiest part was the farms. They were regular little jerry fortresses. If we couldn't manage them on our own, then we'd have to wait while the company commander called back for artillery support. The Navy was still with us too, chucking in shells ahead of us. In three days we advanced seven miles. Then we were told to stand fast and dig in. Next morning we had the news and got it from the BBC. It sounded great. We'd joined up all along the bridgehead. There was a solid line, 45 miles of it. We'd got a foothold. We were in. We didn't have to do much navigating to get there. You just followed the convoys. I was doing close support. We waited around and then the ground troops would whistle us out and told us about some hard target they wanted removed and then in we go. We were like taxis on a cab ring. There's something nice about a beach, any beach. You think of a beach and chances are you'll remember something nice. Like a party or a picnic. Pals from the old days. Girls in bathing suits. But the one I worked, Utah, looked more like a freight yard once we got going. For quite a while, we brought most supplies right over the open beach. Like we'd practiced it and like we'd made up as we went along. We worked a 24-hour shift with ducks, lights, rats, rowboats, all sorts of Rube Goldberg. The stuff just kept pouring in. Tanks, trucks, food, ammo, guys, millions of things.
1940. At the end of a year of war, the people of the British Isles stand on guard against the invader from the continent of Europe. Almost overnight, the British people become a nation of roof spotters, auxiliary police, air raid wardens, and firefighters. Day and night, they watch for the coming of the enemy. This is the most dangerous invasion threat that Britain has ever faced. The German armies, flushed with their victories in Western Europe, all the coastline from Narvik to Bordeaux, the whole mass of Nazi-occupied Europe, its bases and industry and resources, is pitted directly against the island. The way seems clear for the knockout blow against Britain. Across the Straits of Dover, German troops take their stand. Along the French coast, they mount big guns and prepare for invasion. Hitler promises his people that he will dictate peace terms in London by mid-September. In August, the attack begins. After two months of intense preparation, the Nazi Air Force takes off from its bases in France. Its job is to destroy British airfields, cripple the RAF, and prepare the way for the landing parties. In seemingly endless numbers, the bombers with their fighter escorts head toward the English coast. of England, the listening posts are waiting for them, and before they are over the fields of Kent, the anti-aircraft batteries are ready. of the RAF rise to the attack and in the skies of southern England they meet the Germans in the first great air battle of history. Streaking down upon their foes, the Spitfires and Hurricanes do terrible execution. In the month of September, the Nazis lose 900 aircraft. By October, the fighters of the RAF rule the skies of Britain. Below them lies a litter of wrecked Nazi planes strewn across the land they thought to conquer. Driven from the daylight skies, the Nazis turn to indiscriminate night bombing. Dropping the pretense of attacking military objectives, they visit the full terror of air attack on the ordinary people of Britain. But these people of Britain stand up to its terrors. They man their defenses, keep their vigil, and steal their minds and bodies for a protracted siege. London and Liverpool, Birmingham, Coventry and Manchester, Bristol and Plymouth, and a score of other towns, the Nazis set their fires. Docks, warehouses, churches and private homes alike are blasted and smashed, but the firemen fight desperately to preserve their blazing cities from destruction.
In every week of the air war, hundreds of civilians are killed and injured in the cities of Britain. From their suffering is born a grim resolve to fight back and keep fighting until the enemy is completely destroyed. When the smoke clears away, many a famous building has been hit. The Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey have felt the weight of Nazi bombs. Buckingham Palace itself has been damaged. But it takes more than Nazi bombs to turn the British people from their business. They clear away the debris and restore normal services. by the frequent appearance of the leaders who share the same dangers and experiences with them. And they, in turn, hearten friends from America who take back word of their bravery and determination under fire. It is no longer a lightning war. The invasion is off for the time being, but the Nazis are now masters of half a continent, holding down ruthlessly the subject peoples. Munitions and machinery and industrial plants in conquered countries from Norway to France have fallen into their hands. With them, they can outwit the British blockade, build up their forces for another attempt at invasion. British people throw themselves with energy into the struggle. Under the leadership of men like Ernest Bevan, factory workers increase production to unheard of figures. For more and more, the people of Britain and the Dominions realize that production of war equipment is the cornerstone of victory. But harassed by constant air raids, outpaced by the myriad factories of German-occupied Europe, the people of Britain cannot hope alone to reach the production superiority vital to survival. So in December, Britain's Minister of Aircraft Production, Lord Beaverbrook, turns to his native Canada, and from this nation, skilled beyond her years in mass production, he asks still greater and swifter output. Since the very outbreak of the war, Canada has realized her vital function as a supply base for the British Commonwealth, and daily meetings of the Cabinet bring first-hand reports of its urgent needs. Canada has built up her army from its peacetime strength of 50,000 to five or six times that number. She is training them in modern methods of warfare against the day when they will have to meet the disciplined and superbly equipped Nazi divisions. Three months after the outbreak of war, she sends her first division overseas, following it up at regular intervals with a second and a third, and preparing yet others. In England, these cracked troops of the Dominion hold the traditional post of honor, the right of the line. Some guard the approaches to the heart of the empire. Others use their traditional skill as lumbermen in the forest of Scotland. Every day sees an increase in the numbers of young men training for Canada's Navy, ready to man new ships to protect the vital Atlantic highway to Britain. And under her clear skies, free as yet from the drone of enemy aircraft. She is organizing the great Commonwealth air training plan. All across the country rise hangars and workshops, and gangs of men survey and level new airfields to house the swelling ranks of apprentice airmen. She rapidly mobilizes the great natural...
and how they would strike back. Christmas, 1940. Christmas, season of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, was the ironic quiet before Hitler's great burst of rage against a people who couldn't be licked. submission, so he would burn them to ashes. Millions of firebombs rained down on the great city of London. More than 1,500 different sections of the city burst into roaring flames. Flames that swiftly merged into the greatest fire in recorded history. of all the fire and destruction, vital water mains were shattered. Water pressure was almost entirely cut off. Heroes of the night were men of the London Fire Brigade who stretched temporary hose lines out to the center of the Thames River, struggling through mud and slime. For the Nazis had carefully picked a night on which the Thames River had one of the lowest ebb tides on record. While London burned above them, the people of the city held on, chin up and thumbs up. They knew this was the people's war, and they were the people. And a people that couldn't be panicked, couldn't be beaten. months to come, the British were to suffer many such bombings and burnings. But a nation that calls on cold courage when hot courage runs thin may die, but it can't be defeated. The Battle of Britain was won, but not by Hitler. Hitler had lost the battle. He had lost 2,375 German planes and their crews. For the first time, it was the Germans who ate the bitter dirt of defeat. Gone was the legend of their invincibility. For a solid year, the Nazis struck Britain with all their might. They leveled thousands upon thousands of homes and damaged millions of others. They killed more than 40,000 men, women, and children. 
and seriously wounded 50,000 more. But not one single Nazi soldier set foot on British soil. But Hitler couldn't stop. And in our next film, we will show how he had to turn to the east again. Why did the Nazis lose the Battle of Britain? First, because a regimented people met an equally determined free people, and the free people made them quit cold. We've been bombed, dive bombed, high level bombed, machine gunned, been through two invasion scares. The last lot we had, we had the house down about our ears. But we are still sticking it, and we're going to stick it. Second, because this was a new kind of war, and the RAF were the men who could fight it. These were the men who belonged to what Hitler called those weak, soft democracies. The British did more than save their country. They won for the world a year of precious time. It was not only for the people of Britain, but for the people of the world that Winston Churchill spoke when he said, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few.